Hi, my name is Joseph Trossman. I'm a junior nutritional sciences major, and today I will be presenting pediatric malnutrition as a part of the Malnutrition Awareness Week Fair. So we're going to start off with a definition. And for a long time, there wasn't a concrete definition for pediatric malnutrition. And this led to an under-recognition of pediatric malnutrition and its effects. So pediatric malnutrition was actually recently defined by an organization known as ASPEN, which is the American Society for Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition. And we will get to the definitions of parenteral and enteral later. But for now, pediatric malnutrition is defined as an imbalance between actual intakes and nutrient requirements, which results in deficiencies of energy, protein, and or micronutrients. And this negatively affects child growth, development, and more. So in the top right picture, you can see an example of kwashiorkor, which is a disease, and it causes ex extreme enlargement of the stomach, and this is due to protein deficiency in children. And the definition that Aspen came up with is based on anthropometric parameters, which are body measurements, growth, chronicity of malnutrition, etiology, which just is a fancy word for causes, pathogenesis, which is the growth of diseases, and development and functional outcomes. So now we're going to talk about the prevalence of pediatric malnutrition. So the amount of children in the United States who suffer from pediatric malnutrition is actually unknown. But what we do know is one in 10 U.S. households with children are food insecure. Food insecurity is defined as a lack of regular access to healthy food and enough food. About 20 million children under the age of five or around the world are severely malnourished. So now we're going to talk about some of the causes of pediatric malnutrition. And these causes could be based off of non-illness factors or illnesses. Non-illness factors can be behavioral, socioeconomic, environmental, functional, or be based on parental influence or the opposite, parental neglect. And we're gonna to get to examples of each of these factors soon. And there's also illness factors. Illnesses could be acute, which means they last less than three months, or they be, can be chronic, which means they last more than three months. Acute illnesses include trauma, burns, and infection, and chronic illnesses include cystic fibrosis, chronic lung disease, and cancer. And in the picture above, you could see cystic fibrosis. And cystic fibrosis could actually cause malnutrition. These, because during cystic fibrosis, a lot of mucus builds up in the airways. This is bad for their breathing, but this is also harmful means the body cannot absorb enough nutrients because of the thick mucus. And now we're gonna talk about some of the mechanisms of pediatric malnutrition. So non-illness related causes can lead to pediatric malnutrition, mainly through starvation. So starvation could be due to eating disorders, such as anorexia or bulimia. And this is an example of a behavioral mechanism. There's food intolerances and allergies, which are functional. And sometimes kids are just picky eaters. I've worked at a summer camp for many summers. And one time I had a kid who just ate a hot dog bun with salt and pepper for lunch. And this was just an example of being a picky eater. But a lot of the times there's an underlying reason or a food intolerance for why kids won't eat certain foods and we just don't know about it. There's also poverty, which is socioeconomic, and lack of clean drinking water, which is environmental. And if you remember in Flint, Michigan, they have had terrible drinking water, extremely contaminated, 
and as you could see in the picture above, the drinking water even turned orange. So definitely could cause starvation if you're unable to drink enough water, if you can't afford to buy or don't have access to bottled water. And obviously compared to Detroit, which has clean water, the water in Flint was terrible, as I said before. And there's also, so illness related causes can lead to pediatric malnutrition through malabsorption, nutrient loss, hypermetabolism, and altered utilization of nutrients. So now we're going to talk about some of the effects of pediatric malnutrition. So the causes and mechanisms that lead to pediatric malnutrition often result in decreased intake versus required amounts of nutrients, energy and protein imbalances, and micronutrient deficiencies. Some of the common micronutrient deficiencies in children include zinc and iron, but we also see calcium, vitamin D, and magnesium deficiencies in kids who are on vegan diets. And sometimes this could get so bad that the kids on vegan diets actually have seizures because of their nutrient deficiencies. So it's a very serious problem. We need to make sure kids have enough of all of the micronutrients. And the effects of pediatric malnutrition include muscle weakness, loss of lean body mass, developmental or intellectual delay, stunted growth, which is a very common one, immune dysfunction, delayed wound healing, infections, and prolonged hospital stays. And all of the above can be used to help diagnose pediatric malnutrition. But there are some more indicators that are used to actually diagnose and assess pediatric malnutrition. The list below is not all of them, it's just some of them. And they include food and nutrient intake, assessment of energy and protein needs, needs growth parameters, which uses z-scores and standard deviation. This is based off of anthropometric measurements as we have discussed before, weight gain velocity, and hand grip strength. And there's also nutrition assessments. So a pediatric nutrition assessment can include, and again, this is just some of the options. This isn't all of them, but it can include food and nutrition history, nutrition-focused physical exam, client and medical history, anthropometrics, and biochemical data and medical tests and procedures. Again, anthropometrics is body weight measurements. And there's a great tool called Petatools for pediatric dietitians. And you could enter the weight, height, and head circumference, which are all anthropometric measurements. And this can be used to see if a child is growing appropriately, appropriately and this uses z-scores or standard deviation to do that. And for biochemical and medical tests, those are often tests that determine through the blood or urine if a child has enough nutrients or micronutrients. And now we're going to talk about treating pediatric malnutrition. So some of the treatment methods include oral nutrition, so eating more food, or vitamins and mineral supplements if you're missing certain vitamins, minerals, or supplements. Nutrition support, which could be enteral or parenteral. So enteral is tube feedings, and this goes directly to the stomach or the small intestine. And parenteral is through the veins but both are substitutions to normal eating through the mouth when this option is not available. And there's also education on malnutrition and eating more calories and or protein. There's medically and developmentally appropriate diets. There's medical therapy, which can be for any of the causes we've discussed before. So malabsorption, infection, diarrhea, etc. There's also the involvement of social services, which usually occurs if there's parental neglect, unfortunately. And here are my works cited. So thank you so much for listening to my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it.
and I hope you also listen to other presentations and enjoy those as well. All right, have a nice day. Thank you.